Milk delivery services are probably a job you know of, but what about manual alarm clocks? Leech collectors? People that diagnose your personality based on your skull shape? Today, we're going to be talking about some of the weirdest jobs in history that have now been made obsolete. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Fun Fact Fridays. My name is Vamp, and today I'm here to talk to you about jobs that don't exist anymore. Technology and modern sciences have created some fantastic new jobs like voice acting on YouTube, of course but it's also killed others. Let's take a look at what some of these professions were and how they were in time replaced. And if you enjoy content about fun facts such as these obsolete jobs, then make sure you subscribe with notifications on so you never miss an episode. We'll start with one you've probably heard of before, the milkman. Milk delivery in the US began with industrialization. According to the Dairy Alliance, once people moved to urban areas, they didn't have space for a family cow. They would buy milk from local dairy farmers instead, and then the need for milk delivery began. The milkman wouldn't have individual glass or plastic containers though, but just a massive metal barrel. People would bring out jugs, pails, or jars, and the milkman would fill it. About a hundred years or so after the first home milk deliveries began, the first glass milk bottle was patented, the Lester Milk Jar. A cap didn't arrive until about five years later when Henry D. Thatcher invented a different glass milk bottle. By the 20s, designs and advertisements were etched onto the glass. One source writes, Though there were innovations in milk containment, the size and lifespan of milk could not greatly change. Homes didn't have refrigeration for perishable items, so daily milk delivery was necessary to prevent the milk from spoiling before people could drink it. It was the safest and most cost-effective way to get milk and other perishables to customers. Insulated boxes began appearing on the porches of some homes, while others had cubbies or milk boxes that were built into the side of their house. Each day, the milkman would put the bottles of fresh milk inside the box, remove the empty bottles, and collect his payment that was left. First, he transported the milk on a cart, either pulled by a horse or the milkman himself, but as automobiles became more popular, milk trucks replaced the carts. The milkman was changing with the times. Unfortunately, the times were also making things more difficult for the milkman as consumers began moving to suburbs, creating longer distances for milkmen to travel and upping the cost. Still, so long as people didn't have a refrigerator, then people needed their fresh milk. Of course, by the 30s and 40s, that changed too, with more and more Americans owning cars and large refrigerated cases becoming common. Buying milk became easy and deliveries soon became unnecessary. Funnily enough, in 1958, artist Arthur Raidbaugh published an edition of his weekly comic strip, Closer Than We Think, where he imagined mailmen of the future delivering milk to customers' doors wearing a jetpack. Though this may not be the future that milkmen ended up having in today's world, there isn't no future for milkmen whatsoever. In some communities, the milkman has returned, perhaps not in full force, but a company known as Thatcher Farm delivers milk to people living on the outskirts of Boston. By some estimates, it only costs about 50 cents more per bottle, and you save a trip to the grocery store. With food delivery services on the rise, it's no wonder that milk delivery would eventually fall into the same category. Not that milk delivery is anywhere near what it used to be. Department of Agriculture figures say that in 1963, about 30% of consumers had milk delivered. By 1975, the number was only 6.9%, and in 2005, there were only 0.4%. Not even 1% of people. Others say that numbers could grow, though. In 2007, the New York Times read, Norm Monson, a consultant for the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, says a milkman renaissance is starting to take shape in many parts of the country. Consumers, he said, are increasingly willing to pay the $2 typical premium for a gallon of home-delivered milk over the store-bought variety. I would say, seven years ago, there was little to no home delivery of milk going on in Wisconsin. Now we have about five companies doing that, he said. And that's a big deal because we don't have a huge population in Wisconsin. I've seen it growing throughout the Midwest. For Oberweis Dairy in North Aurora, home delivery customers have increased to 40,000 from 10,000 in 1997. Not to mention the demand for farm fresh milk grew massively during the pandemic. In Central Valley, Top of the Morning Farms said that about a month after lockdown first began, they had a 700 person wait list. 
Another one of these milk delivery services, Cowbell, run by Angie Rondelet, saw deliveries triple from 120 to 160 in a week to about 325. In December 2020, the head of dairy policy analysis at the University of Wisconsin-Madison said that the sale of milk has gone up for the first time in a decade, going against a shockingly steady decline over the last 10 years, too. The pandemic definitely changed grocery shopping in general, and as time moved forward, I'm curious to see how many people make these home delivery services permanent. A knocker-up, or knocker-upper, was a manual alarm clock. Though this begs the question, who woke up the alarm clocks? But seriously, in industrial Britain, even up until the 1970s, in some places, many workers were woken up by tapping at their windows. Though this might scare the hell out of them now, a knocker-upper would go around with a long walking stick with a wire or knob on the end, tap a window a few times, then move on to the next house. Other sources say they didn't move until receiving confirmation their client was awake. Some use soft hammers, rattles, or pea shooters to get the job done, too. You might ask, well, why wouldn't they just run around with a gong or something to get everyone up at once? Well, that would be waking up customers that aren't paying, not to mention ones that didn't want to be woken. According to the BBC, one problem knocker-uppers faced was making sure that workers did not get woken up for free. When knocking up began to be a regular trade, we used to rap or ring at the doors of our customers. Mrs. Waters, a knocker-upper in North of England, told an intrigued reporter from Canada's Huron Expositor newspaper in 1878. The public complained of being disturbed by our loud rapping or ringing, and the knocker-up soon found out that while he knocked up one who paid him, he knocked up several on each side who did not. The solution they hit was modifying a long stick with which to tap on the bedroom windows of their clients loudly enough to rouse those intended, but softly enough to not disturb the rest. It seems I'm not the only one who asked who woke up the knocker-uppers either, because a tongue twister from that time actually addresses this and reads. Now bear with me. We had a knocker-upper, and our knocker-upper had a knocker-up, and our knocker-upper's knocker-up didn't knock up our knocker-up, so our knocker-up didn't knock us up, because he's not up. Don't judge me. The knocker-up was a well-respected profession and employed mostly elderly people, though some police officers would also act as knocker-uppers during their night shifts. Sometimes mining companies would hire knocker-ups, though this burden largely fell to the individual. The price also depended on the hour, 4 a.m. being more expensive than waking hours between 5 and 6. In a time when alarm clocks were rare, unreliable, and costly, hiring a knocker up made the most sense. After all, workers could lose their jobs if they consistently overslept, so having a knocker up was a necessity of the time. Of course, once alarm clocks became more reliable, the job became obsolete. Now, if you have someone knocking on your window at 4 a.m., call the police. Another unique profession you've probably heard of in some capacity is a food taster. And no, I don't mean a food critic, but someone who was hired to be sure that food or drink wasn't poisoned by taking the first sip or bite in a meal to assure the person in the position of power that they aren't being poisoned. One such infamous story about food testing talks about Mark Anthony, Cleopatra's husband. The story goes, his foolish and childish fondness for Cleopatra was mingled with jealousy, suspicion, and distrust and he was so afraid that Cleopatra might secretly poison him that he would never take any food or wine without requiring that she would taste it before him. At length, one day, Cleopatra caused the petals of some flowers to be poisoned and then had the flowers woven into the chefflet, which Anthony was to wear at supper. In the midst of the feast, she pulled off the leaves of the flowers from her own chefflet and put them playfully into her wine and then proposed that Anthony should do the same with his chaplet and that they should drink the wine, tinctured as it would be, with the color and the perfume of the flowers. Anthony entered very readily into this proposal and when he was about to drink the wine, she arrested his hand and told him that it was poisoned. You see now, she said, how vain it is for you to watch against me. If it were possible for me to live without you, how easy it would be for me to devise ways and means to kill you. Then, to prove that her words were true, she ordered one of the servants to drink Anthony's wine. He did so and died before their sight in dreadful agony. 
In other words, Cleopatra wasn't offended that her husband didn't trust her, but that he thought a food taster could possibly save him from her if she truly tried to do away with him. Food tasters also served the English monarchy, such as Elizabeth I, because the fear of her being poisoned was so real. There was even an elaborate ritual and formal process to food tasting during her reign. First, all the plates were wiped off and then 24 royal bodyguards would enter one for each course to be tasted. Noble men would receive each of the dishes and a female food taster would serve each plate bearer a bite. Then, when an appropriate amount of time passed, drums and trumpets sounded and the food was brought into the private chambers of the queen where she'd select the ones she wanted. Henry VIII, on the other hand, wasn't quite as formal with his testers. He may have had, unsurprisingly, been quite cruel to them. Although their role isn't extremely well known, we know that they spent the entire time on their knees, a task in and of itself considering how long these feasts could last. Not only this, but they'd take massive bites of dishes, not just a nibble to attempt to ensure the food was safe as much as possible. They'd even kiss the king's tablecloth and seat cushion, and if their lips didn't itch or swell, then it was assumed to be poison free. Dictators too had food tasters. Margot Wolk, who was 95 years old in 2013, claims she was a taste tester for, get this, Hitler himself. She says that for most of her life, she kept silent and hadn't discussed these events in detail. Now in her old age, Wolk is ready to talk, according to the Smithsonian. Wolk was the sole survivor of the Nazi leader's poison paranoia. In her mid-twenties, she was swept away from her home in Rattensburg, now Ketres, Poland, drafted into civilian service to join 14 other women in the dictator's wartime bunker where she and the others were charged with taste testing the leader's meals. As the war dragged on, food supplies in much of German-occupied territory suffered. Within the wolf's lair, however, the food was delicious. Only the best vegetables, asparagus, bell peppers, everything you can imagine, and always with a side of rice or pasta, said Wolk. He was a vegetarian. He never ate any meat during the entire time I was there, Wolk said of the Nazi leader, and Hitler was so paranoid that the British would poison him. That's why he's had 15 girls taste the food before he ate it himself. But each meal brought fear, said Wolk. We knew of all of those poisoning rumors and could never enjoy the food. Every day we feared it was going to be our last meal. Food testing like this has to be the most terrifying job on the list without a doubt. Though the other taste testers were shot at the end of the war, Wolk fled only to suffer abuse at the hands of Russian troops. She insisted she was never a party member and never even saw Hitler personally, just as food. There's plenty of other examples of food tasters throughout history as well. Like Halitos, the tester of Roman Emperor Claudius, he became noteworthy after Claudius was killed by poison in AD 54, leading many to believe that Halitos committed the act. According to the Smithsonian though, any taster wouldn't exactly be able to warn the emperor, even if they did ingest poison food, considering how long some effects can take to kick in. Chemicals like arsenic, trioxide, cyanide, strychnine, and atropine have traditionally been used to poison people. Of those, only cyanide can kill within minutes, thus giving the tester enough time to fulfill his job description by notifying others of the tainted meal, Emsley said. If given in large doses, alkaloid poisons like strychnine and atropine can kill within 24 hours, while arsenic would make the victim vomit within a few hours and possibly die within a day. Even so, food testing is still used to this day. It's not technically obsolete, but it's considered to be somewhat of a placebo effect. Once you take into account how slow acting some poisons are, a more recent example of a food tester circulated when in 2013, one report claimed that President Obama refused to eat lunch with Senate Republicans on Capitol Hill because his taster wasn't present. The U.S. Secret Service has always refused to confirm if presidents travel with a taster or not, but this report sure makes it seem that way. Other separate reports of a French restaurant in Paris also confirmed that someone tasted the president's food when he was there for dinner. Initially, there was some tension, understandable from the cook's perspective, but the taster was said to be nice and relaxed, so everything turned out alright. All in all. There's no shortage of examples of tasters throughout history, even if this job isn't as nearly heard of nowadays. Another non-existent job is actually entirely based on faulty logic and science. 
Phrenology is the study of a person's head, quite literally. Phrenologists would examine perturbances on a skull, diagnose people with personality traits, and tell clients what career paths were suited for them, and what they should look for in a partner based on their head shape, like a palm reader, but for your skull. As you can imagine, the science behind this practice has been discredited and is not really done anymore, but back in the late 1800s, it was incredibly widespread. In London, 1876, Mark Twain saw an advertisement from American Lorenzo N. Fowler, who dubbed himself a practical phrenologist. I found Fowler on duty, Twain wrote, amidst the impressive symbols of his trade on brackets on tables all about the room stood marble white bus, hairless, every inch of the skull occupied by a shallow bump and every bump labeled with its imposing name in black letters. During the 19th century, thousands of busts like those Twain described were manufactured and sold by Fowler and others. One of them, its surfaces inked with lines showing the location of such traits as conjuality and combativeness, is on display at the American History Museum's Science in American Life exhibit, surrounded by other measures of human intellect and personality. Even stranger still, pharaonologists also believe that these personality traits and the organs that created them could be modified through the practice of restraint or by the conscious exercise of a positive quality. So in other words, if a large protrusion in the back of your skull meant that you were irritable, you could make it go away by thinking pleasant thoughts more frequently? No thanks. If I have a large protrusion on my head, I'm heading to the doctors, thank you very much. Unsurprisingly, the church calling the founder of phrenology, Franz Joseph Gall, a heretic, only helped spread these matters more. Getting the attention of the public, references to phrenology can be found throughout history in Walt Whitman's and Edgar Allan Poe's works, as well as Charlotte Bronte and Herman Melville. But though phrenology is without a doubt ridiculous, it was still an interesting as well as necessary step in our understanding of the human brain. As early as 1929, in his History of Experimental Psychology, Harvard psychologist Edwin G. Boring wrote that it is almost correct to say that scientific psychology was born of phrenology out of wedlock with science. It had, after all, an understanding that physiological characteristics of the brain influence behavior and conversely, that behavior can alter our very psychology. Of course, today, scientists look at changes in neurochemistry and synaptic connections rather than brain organs, but the principle is the same. Phrenologists also reckoned that the mind is not unitary, but composed of independent faculties. Their ideas, in other guises, have since given birth to the field of cognitive psychology, which breaks down mental functions such as reading into separate faculties, letter recognition, sentence comprehension, and so forth. As easily it is to mock these ideals now, it's still for the best that this happened, as it was a leap forward to see the brain this way. Phrenologists were on the right track when they said that different mental functions are located in the brain. As one neuroscientist explains, the problem is simple where phrenologists took this information. Back in the day, phrenologists were breaking new ground and they were genuinely astounding for their time. Another job relating to flawed logic and science is that of a leech collector. The practice of bloodletting originated thousands of years ago, likely in ancient Egypt, before it spread to Greece. Physicians there, in 3rd century BC, believed all illnesses stemmed from an overabundance of blood. So a doctor would open a vein with a lance or a sharpened piece of wood, literally letting out blood. Sometimes leeches would perform this task. At every feeding, a leech can ingest about 5 to 10 milliliters of blood, about 10 times its own body weight. Dr. Francois Brousset, a Parisian physician who lived from 1772 to 1838 greatly influenced the use of leeches because he claims all fevers were because of organ inflammation. He believed in placing leeches over the organ that was inflamed to treat said fever and, in part, because of his advocacy, over 5 to 6 million leeches were used each year in Paris by the 1830s. As it turns out, we know now that Brousset isn't actually completely wrong. Leech saliva contains huridin, a natural anticoagulant, so he did have some good points, even if they can't simply be used for everything under the sun either. Of course, someone had to gather up these leeches from lakes, bogs, marshes, and wherever else they could be found, hence the job of the leech collector. 
they lure leeches with animal legs, sometimes old horses, or their own legs, and gather up leeches to sell. Leech collectors often suffered from blood loss, as you can imagine, and infections spread by the leeches. Many leech collectors, according to the 1814 book The Costume of Yorkshire, were Scottish women. Unfortunately, there were even more downsides to the profession and the practice of bloodletting. Overharvesting was a problem, but so was the drainage and development of land for agriculture, which reduced leech habitat. By the end of the 18th century, medicinal leeches were nearly extinct in many countries, including Ireland, England, Wales, and the Netherlands. In response, countries began farming leeches and importing wild ones from places as far away as Russia, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. As wild populations dwindled, efforts to harvest local leeches grew more desperate. The scene captured by the leech finder, an 1814 colored print of three leech collectors was in marked contrast to how leech collectors were shown just a few decades later. In a clipping from the French medical publication Gazette de Opito, its author describes a lonely pale man collecting leeches, noting his woe-begotten aspect, his hollow eyes, his livid lips, his singular gestures. It would be understandable, the author adds, to take him for a maniac. English poet William Woodsworth captured a similar image of the vanishing leech collector. He told that to these waters he had come, to gather leeches, being old and poor, employment hazardous and wearisome. He had many hardships to endure, from pond to pond he roamed, from moor to moor, housing with God's good help, by choice or chance. And in this way he gained an honest maintenance. Although leech collecting was never a glamorous job, it most certainly got worse and became no longer viable, even long before the practice of bloodletting stopped. Instead, in later years, a medical leech kit was designated to become more appealing for the practice of bloodletting. Leeches seemed to make a resurgence in the 1830s when cholera spread across Europe and North America, but leeches proved to be no match, and their use suffered a long decline afterwards. Leeches are still used today from time to time. In 1985, leech therapy even made headlines when an American plastic surgeon named Joseph Upton used it to reattach a five-year-old's ear after it had been bitten off by a dog. By draining blood that's pooled, leeches can stimulate and encourage blood flow, so they are definitely handy little critters. In 2004, the FDA even approved their use for reconstructive and plastic surgery. According to NBC News at the time, the Food and Drug Administration said that Recarepex, SAS, a French firm, is the first company to request and receive FDA clearance to market the blood-sucking aquatic animals as medical devices. FDA reports that leeches can help skin grafts by removing blood pooled under the graft and restore blood circulation in blocked veins by removing pooled blood. In considering the Recarepex application, the FDA said it analyzed the use of leeches in medicine, evaluated safety data provided by the firm and studied how the leeches are fed, their environment, and the personnel who handle them. From manual alarm clocks to leech collecting to taste testing, there's plenty of jobs on here that I don't want to have. What would be your least favorite? Let me know in the comments down below. In the meantime, we'll see you again soon, and thanks for watching. If you want to see more content from me, you can check out my Twitch channel in the link down below, but remember to stay hydrated, guys. Take it easy.